Psalm 14. I did some calculations and at our current pace, we'll be finished with the book of Psalms in 2018. I was just kidding. I didn't do the calculation. That sounds about right, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I like that response, Sam. Oh, well. <laughs> and what follows from that? <laughs> We've never been in a hurry before, right? Well, Psalm 14, I was really uh, encouraged this week as I did a deep dive into Psalm 14 because of the content of the psalm. It defies uh, categorization, if you will. It's not really a psalm of lament, like some psalms are. It's not really a, a wisdom psalm. It's not really a prophetic psalm. I mean, there are many classifications of psalms. This one doesn't really fit any of those in its entirety. It has bits and pieces or elements of, of all of it. I like it. It, it even has uh, a prophetic element in it. When we get down to the last verse, uh, we could call it the hallelujah verse, if you will, in this psalm at least. Jesus is coming again. I can't wait for that day. But this psalm is very encouraging to me. Now, this morning, we're going to focus on a, a whole other aspect. I hope to do not a real deep dive, but dive into some theology and some doctrine. Now, I know some of you, your eyes are starting to glaze over already. Theology and doctrine, really, Mike? No, listen. This is the foundation of your faith. Theology and doctrine is the foundation of your faith. And so we want to look at some of these things that are being said in this psalm today. Now, if I was to summarize this psalm, it would be this. Denying God has consequences both in this life and most certainly in eternity. Denying God in this life has consequences in this life, in space and time, right now, but most especially in eternity. In eternity. Let's read it together, shall we? Psalm 14, starting at verse 1, and read it together uh, out loud if you don't mind, unless you're embarrassed that other people hear you reading. But let's read it together, starting at verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation." You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Wow. How important was it when you were growing up? Think back. Some of you, it's a little longer than others, but think back. To when you were growing up. And some of you, I look across, and you are still growing up in your parents' household. Think about this. How important was it when your parents told you to do something? Did you kind of just, yeah, yeah, yeah? Or did you react and respond immediately? How important was it when they used your full name, first, middle, and last? That ratches it up, doesn't it? How important was it when they said something to the effect, don't make me tell you a second time? Or are there any parents in here who have never uttered that phrase? <laughs> 
My all-time favorite, though, is don't make me pull this car over. But I'll save that for another passage of Scripture. If it's important to us when we receive instruction from somebody that we respect once and maybe even twice because we haven't responded, how important is it when God gives us instruction and then he repeats it a second time and then just to make sure that we understand it, he says the same thing three times times. How much importance would you place on that? Would you sit up and pay attention to that maybe? If God says it three times? Well, we know from the scripture, the pattern is that anything that is repeated in the scripture, pay attention. If it's three times, listen, you need to drop everything and focus on what's being said. Well, I give you that illustration this morning because that's what we find here in Psalm 14. We have a perfect example of the importance of what God has to say because Psalm 14 is repeated almost in its entirety for you note takers. And we'll look at this in the course of this teaching this morning. It's repeated almost in its entirety word for word in Psalm 53, note takers. And then in Romans chapter 3, a passage in Psalm 14 is repeated again. Paul quotes this in Romans 3, and that will help us to understand the significance of what is being said here today. Now, as an extra bonus, if we get this far this morning, note takers, Romans chapter 1, especially verses 18 through 32, is a definition or a description or a commentary, if you will, on Psalm 14. Now you go do that on your own study. We'll try to work that in and, and read that and comment on that in the course of this teaching. But again, Psalm 53 is almost a word for word. Romans 3 borrows several passages, several verses from this psalm. And Romans 1 is a commentary on the whole psalm. So we'll look at those things in order. Now, note this very first point here from verse 1. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. The first point that I want you to get out of this is this. Denying God makes you a fool, not a wise person. Now, doesn't that go exactly the opposite of what the world says today? The world says, you believe in God? Are you for real? You can't possibly believe that God, a God, the God, that he actually exists? You believe that? Has anybody ever had a conversation with someone who has said something like that? Do you actually believe that? Do you believe in fairy tales too? You probably think Cinderella was real. Well, she was. What's your problem? What do you mean? People today in the culture that we live in if you espouse a belief in the biblical God, they kind of look at you like, I'm not sure about you. I'm not sure about you. And I like to point to this passage and say, listen, you've tried to turn the tables, but the fact of the matter is that your creator says by denying him, you are the fool. You are the fool. Now, when we use that word in our culture today, fool, we have an incorrect, well, it's a correct definition for our culture, but it's not the biblical definition. Because when we think of fool, what words come to mind in our culture? If we say somebody's a fool, we think they're what? Anything. Stupid, an idiot, slow of understanding or learning, silly, silly. Well, that's foolish. That's silliness. Well, the biblical definition and we, and we have a picture, so let's, let's turn to a couple places so that we can grasp this. Our normal definition of foolish is that somebody is silly or stupid or slow of learning or something like that, but that's not the biblical definition of it. Fool is from the Hebrew word nabal, N-A-B-A-L, nabal. 
Now, what's interesting about that is the Bible gives us an illustration of the meaning of that word in its text. And some of you are already thinking, ah, yeah, I seem to remember there was a Old Testament figure by the name of Nabal. <laughs> yeah, let's turn there together, shall we? It's 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 25. And let's look at that. This is a good definition. Now, the context of this passage in 1 Samuel, what's going on here, is David is still on the run, still hiding in the desert, but he encounters Saul and a portion of his army in a place called En Gedi. En Gedi. David had the opportunity to take Saul's life, and he chose not to. He said, no, this is not. And by the way, That is the contextual application is touch not God's anointed. God is stopping David from doing something. He says, I will not do that. So Saul, after finding that out, and that's chapter 24, is humbled and bids David God's peace and go in peace. And he turns around and he heads back to his palace. So, after that, chapter 25 picks up the narrative, and it seems that David and his men had been providing protection while they were living in the wilderness for a very wealthy uh, sheep herder and business person by the name of Nabal. Now, Nabal, he was a very cantankerous, mean-spirited, hateful man. David had been providing protection and guarding his shepherds and his flocks, but he did it as a business transaction. Nabal, you have all of these resources. My men need fed. How about this? We'll be your security forces for your flocks, and in exchange, you pay us provisions, food and water, olive oil, and things of that nature that a standing army needs, right? Payday came. David sent his emissaries to Nabal and said, we would like the provisions that we bartered for in exchange for your protection. Nabal said, you must be nuts. Now, that's my paraphrase. I'm not giving you anything. So David's men turned around and went back to David and said, well, we're dealing with a crook. Now, this is my paraphrase, by the way. You're going to read something entirely, but is, this is what's happening. We're dealing with a crook. So I guess we're going to have to go and straighten him out. In the meantime, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Nabal's wife, Abigail, finds out, oh, man, what has my husband done now? He has gotten himself in a real pickle because David's going to come and it's going to be the end of his life. She, what does she do? Well, look with me at verse 18 of chapter 25. After finding out what her husband did, well, here is her opinion of him, verse 17. This is Abigail. Now, therefore, know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. So, we're going to bypass him. Here's the plan. This is Abigail, verse 18. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Remember, she's feeding an army. She said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. It came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. Yeah, they were going to set things straight. So she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness so that nothing was missing of all that belonged to him and he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. So 
They were going to wipe them out. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. Wow, that's courageous. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal, worthless one, foolish one, but in a different sense. And I'll give it to you here in a moment. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Or this never would have happened, David. If I would have met them, I would have gladly paid what was owed and not tried to rip you off as my husband. Now, that's one snapshot. Turn over to Isaiah and this will conclude the snapshot and I'll give you the definition, the biblical definition of a fool. Isaiah chapter 32. And let's look at verse 1. Start at verse 1 of Isaiah 32. This is even a clearer, a clearer picture of the nature of a Nabal, of a fool. Isaiah 32, starting at verse 1. Behold, a king will reign righteously and princes will rule justly. This, by the way, is a snapshot or a picture of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This is picturing Jesus' return to the earth. So behold, a king will reign righteously, that's Christ, and princes will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. That's talking about the millennial reign, how things are going to change when Jesus comes back. Verse 3, Then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will listen. That is reminiscent of Jesus saying, For all those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will see and hear your redemption. The mind of the hasty will discern the truth and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. No longer will the Nabal, no longer will the fool be called noble or the rogue be spoken of as generous. Now, I can't help but see a commentary on the times that we live in today. Because the most evil people in our culture today, brothers and sisters, seem to have a reputation, at least in our culture, as being good, upright, and upstanding citizens. Evil people being called noble. Or the rogue be spoken of as generous. For a fool, a nabal, speaks nonsense. And here's the key. And his heart inclines toward wickedness to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord. There's your definition, a biblical definition of a fool or a nabal. A nabal or a fool is not someone who is somehow intellectually deficient, silly or stupid, or slow in learning. Not at all. In a biblical sense, a Nabal is someone who is aggressively wicked. A fool in the biblical sense is someone who is purposefully ungodly. That is a fool. And that's why we read in verse 1 of Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He is purposely wicked, purposely practices ungodliness. That is the fool. Now, notice a couple of things about this in verse 1. In the Hebrew, the Hebrew grammar, in the English it says there is no God. In the Hebrew, it simply says no God. But it says it emphatically. The Hebrew says 
in his heart, the Nabal has said in his heart, no God. Now, when we hear that, what do we think? Well, we think they don't want God to exist. They don't want to live in a universe where there is a God. Well, what is that really saying? Huh. It tells me the biggest problem is that there is no God. This verse is saying the fool doesn't want there to be a God. No God. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live according to this God of the Bible. But that's vastly different from there is no God, isn't it? They just don't want there to be a God. Now, notice also that the Nabal, the fool, has said in his heart, no God. What that is saying, brothers and sisters, is that the fool, the one who is wicked, purposely wicked, purposely ungodly, has made a conscious decision. Remember, in the Bible, when we're talking about the heart, the heart is the seat of emotions. It's the seat of the will. It's as if I'm saying, I have decided not to do this. Will you decide that in your heart, biblically speaking? So the Nabal, the purposely wicked, the purposely ungodly person who says, I don't want God to exist, has made that decision in their heart first, and then it comes out in their behavior, right? So being a God denier, what the Bible calls a fool, is volitional. It's volitional. What does that mean? It means it's a matter of the will. You have chosen to take that position. You have made a conscious decision. I don't want there to be a God. Now, we know that's the case because many, many atheists, unbelievers, lost people, pagans, heathens, whatever you want to call them, when they're honest or when you can catch them in a moment of candor, they'll say exactly that. It's not that there's not enough evidence for God. It's that they don't want there to be a God. They don't want to live in a universe where God actually reigns. Now, you knew I would bring some examples of that, right? Those of you who've been engaged in our Wednesday night study, you've got this textbook, but in I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Note takers on page 88. This is a quote from Robert Jastrow. At the time, he was the director of the Wilson Observatory. And for over 20 years prior to that, he was the director of NASA's Space Studies Institute, the Goddard Institute. This is what Jastrow had to say about, and the context is that science is actually a religion. Science is actually religion. It takes actually more faith in the scientific method than it does in the God of the Bible. And, that, of course, that's the whole purpose of this book, right? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist because being an atheist takes more faith than it does faith to be a Christian. Why is that? Well, because all of the evidence for, that science points to points to a creator, to intelligent design, to purpose and design in the universe. And you've got to throw all that out the window and disregard all of that to continue on in your unbelief that God doesn't exist. It takes much more faith to take that position. But this is what Jastrow said. He said, quote, Theologians generally are delighted with the proof that the universe had a beginning, but astronomers are curiously upset. Their reactions provide an interesting demonstration of the response of the scientific mind, the response of astronomers who are upset with the evidence that points to a designer. They're upset Their reactions provide an interesting demonstration of the response of the scientific mind, supposedly a very objective mind. When evidence uncovered by science itself leads to a conflict with the articles of faith in our profession. 
Well, what are the articles of faith? Well, part of the articles of faith for science is that there is no such thing as a metaphysical realm. The only thing that there is is the natural realm. So they a priori disregard, throw out the possibility of a supernatural being. But we know logically and rationally that that's circular reasoning, isn't it? Well, of course you're going to arrive at the point that, that God doesn't exist if that's your beginning point. I'm starting with God doesn't exist and all of this evidence proves that God doesn't exist. Wait a minute, that was your starting point. How can you... But Jastrow says it turns out that the scientist behaves the way the rest of us do when our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. We become irritated, we pretend the conflict does not exist, or we paper it over with meaningless phrases. And then he says this. He says, there is a kind of religion in science. Every effect must have its cause. There is no first cause. This religious faith of the scientist is violated by the discovery that the world had a beginning under conditions in which the known laws of physics are not valid. And as a product of forces or circumstances, we cannot discover. When that happens, the scientist has lost control. If he really examined the implications, he would be traumatized. As usual, when faced with trauma, the mind reacts by ignoring the implications. In science, this is known as refusing to speculate or trivializing the origin of the earth by calling it the Big Bang as if the universe were a firecracker. And then we have this from... Richard Lewontin, who at the time that he made this statement was an evolutionary biologist at Harvard University. And by evolutionary biologist, I mean an atheistic biologist. He said this. He said, quote, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment to materialism. That was my point. When you start with God doesn't exist and you argue for he doesn't exist, of course you're going to end up that he doesn't exist. But that was your starting point. You have a, a prior commitment to that. That's not scientific investigation, and it isn't rational discussion. Lewontin continues, he says, it's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a defined foot in the door. <laughs> in other words, scientists do not want God to exist. It's not a basis, it's not on the basis of evidence, it's on the basis of the will. It's volitional. We don't want there to be a God. Now, that has some implications. <laughs> Why is it that they so steadfastly reject the idea of God, the fool, the Nabal, who instead chooses to be purposely wicked. This is why. And this again is from I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, page 162 for you note-takers that have the textbook. 
If you want the other quotes, just look up in, the, in your index, Lewontin, uh, L-E-W-O-N-T-I-N is the last name. You'll find it in there in the pages that references it. But if we go back to Richard Lewontin's quote from the last chapter, recall his assertion that Darwinists believe in the absurdities they do because materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, that's the real issue, keeping God out. But why would Darwinists, why would uh, uh, atheists, why would they not want a divine foot in the door? At least four reasons. First, by admitting God, atheists, Darwinists, would be admitting that they are not the highest order when it comes to truth. Currently, in this technologically advanced world, scientists are viewed by the public as the revered authority figures, the new priests who make a better life possible and who comprise the sole source of objective truth. Allowing the possibility of God would be to relinquish their claim of superior authority. Second, by admitting God, atheists, Darwinists, Nabals among us, would be admitting that they don't have absolute authority when it comes to explaining causes. In other words, if God exists, they couldn't explain every event as the result of predictable natural laws. Lewontin put it this way, to appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. And as Richard Jastrow noted, when that happens, the scientist has lost control, certainly to God and perhaps to the theologian. Thirdly, by admitting God, atheists or the Nabals among us would risk losing financial security and professional admiration. How so? Because there's tremendous pressure in the academic community to publish something that supports evolution. Find something important and you may find yourself on the cover of National Geographic or the subject of a PBS special. Find nothing and you may find yourself out of a job, out of grant money, or at least out of favor with your materialistic colleagues. So there's a money, job security, and prestige motive to advancing the Darwinian worldview. And then finally, and perhaps the most significantly, by admitting God, atheists or the Nabals among us would be admitting that they don't have the authority to define right and wrong for themselves. By ruling out the supernatural, atheists, Darwinists, the Nabals among us can avoid the possibility that anything is morally prohibited. Folks, have you ever heard of, read of, seen, experienced a time in a civilization where that last statement was truer? You see, admitting that God exists means that there is a moral authority to life that we should be living under, by, and in obedience to. And our culture today, more than any other culture that I'm aware of through my study is at a place where they are wholesale rejecting God simply on the basis of they want their own moral standard to prevail. Many unbelievers over the years have mockingly called Christianity a crutch, a psychological diversion to make you feel comfortable. Atheistic philosophers down through the years, and you could name them off. I, I think of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, that made those kinds of statements. Um, I believe it was Nietzsche who said that, that God, that religion is the opiate of the masses. It's a drug that we willingly take to soothe us, to soothe the sorrows of life, and that's about it. And of course, modern psychiatry and psychotherapy, the brainchild of one Sigmund Freud, a Jewish atheist, said the same thing. In fact, let me read you a quote from him. This is from Joe Coffey's book. I shared this with the Wednesday night study group, Smooth Stones. Smooth Stones, subtitled, Bringing Down the Giant Questions. So a play on David and 
his toppling of Goliath, but it basically the book covers the big questions that unbelievers will ask, and it's a good primer for equipping you to share your faith and to answer those objections when people ask them. Excellent book. Joe Coffey, Smooth Stones. But this is what he shares about Sigmund Freud. He says, Sigmund Freud was not a fan of religion. He thought belief in God was a sign of a mental disorder. You know, that's being talked about again today. Now get this picture. Every form of deviant behavior, including, I'm glad you're all sitting down, but including pedophilia. Conversations are already underway where they want to remove pedophilia from under the mental disorder category and simply call it a lifestyle choice. Now, don't think I'm making this stuff up. You know I don't do that. Do the research. The conversations are going on right now. They've already removed homosexuality from a mental disorder. And parallel to that, while they're moving all of the deviant, depraved, wicked, and evil behaviors that the Bible calls sin and an abomination to God, moving them out, they want to move Christianity and those who believe in a creator God into the category of having a mental disorder. The conversations are underway, folks. It's happening now. Now, people have called me crazy for years, so that doesn't bother me. But pretty soon, they want to make it official. <laughs> well, we, yeah, that doesn't bother me either, but... <laughs> I don't think it's so far-fetched to picture a day when we are considered mentally disabled and they'll want to treat us. which of course includes incarceration, right? Because you're a danger. Oh my, what? You better wake up. You had better wake up. The battle's being brought to us. If we think we can hide all cloistered in our, in our churches and not be seen, you're crazy. Because we cannot. And I don't think I'm going to get there this morning, but... Stay tuned for part two next week. We'll pick it up in verse one. <laughs> but anyway, let me finish this quote from, from Freud. <laughs> so Coffey says, Sigmund Freud was not a fan of religion. He thought belief in God was a sign of a mental disorder, something he called universal obsessional neurosis. He actually tagged it, put a name on it. He said, God does not exist, and to truly believe in something that does not exist and to live by that belief is to break from reality, an illness that needs to be cured. People are saying that today. The Nabals among us are making this same statement today. The purposely wicked, those that are intent on ungodliness, who choose to deny God has any authority over their lives. Remember, it's volitional. It's not intellectual. They know in their hearts, and of course, we won't get there today, but that, this psalm says that. They know in their hearts that God exists, but they refuse to recognize Him as such. It's not there is no God. It's no God. I don't want there to be a God. So Freud says... That to truly believe in something that does not exist and to live by that belief is to break from reality an illness that needs to be cured. In one sense, Freud was right. If a person breaks from reality and believes in something that doesn't exist, that belief will soon prove unhealthy. It will have a negative impact on his or her life. Let's say I believe Martians are hiding in the walls of my house. At first, I merely hear noises, but as time goes on, I will demonstrate a range of behaviors that become increasingly detrimental, like cashing in my life savings and moving to the desert. 
The further we distort or depart from reality, the unhealthier we become. Is this what happens when people believe in God? Patrick Glenn provides evidence and a stunning answer to that question. This is a quote. This is on page 16 and 17 of Coffee's book, by the way, if you get it. Glenn, I quote, Ironically enough, scientific research in psychology over the past 25 years has demonstrated that far from being a neurosis or source of neurosis, as Freud and his disciples claim, religious beliefs is one of the most consistent correlates of overall mental health and happiness. Study after study have shown a powerful relationship between religious belief and practice on the one hand and healthy behaviors with regard to such problems as suicide, alcohol, drug abuse, divorce, depression, and perhaps even surprisingly, levels of sexual satisfaction in marriage on the other. In short, the empirical data run exactly contrary to the supposedly scientific consensus of the psychotherapeutic profession. David B. Larson, a doctor, agrees. A psychiatrist trained at Duke who founded and directed the National Institute for Healthcare Research, Dr. Larson observed the same phenomena and drew his conclusion. This is a quote from, from Dr. Larson. If a new health treatment were discovered that helped to reduce the rate of teenage suicide, prevent drug and alcohol abuse, improve treatment for depression, reduce recovery from time from surgery, lower divorce rates, and enhance a sense of well-being, one would think that every physician in the country would be scrambling to try it." End quote. Coffee says, Larson is saying that a belief in God results in all these things. So every physician in the country ought to prescribe it when you come in with a problem. Can you imagine your doctor saying, oh, listen, I'm going to operate. Do you believe in God? That will help you with your recovery and your anxiety and depression too. I think Freud is right in one sense. If you honestly believe in something that does not exist, you will become less healthy and probably become mentally ill. Yet we have this mountain of evidence indicating that a strong faith in God results in better mental health. By Freud's argument, wouldn't that indicate that people who believe in God are not distorting reality because, in fact, God is real? And there it is again. God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. You see, and we'll get there next week, but that is something that we know intuitively as believers, that there is a God. He is. He has placed that truth in our hearts. And, oh, by the way, the Nabals among us no God, they know it too. Don't let them off the hook. They know in their heart of hearts, and we'll discuss this, we'll get into it more next week, but we'll discuss it. They know, they just don't want there to be a God. It doesn't fit into their lifestyle. That's the bottom line. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for an encouraging time of study. We pray that you would help us, Lord, as we encounter the Nabals in our families, the Nabals that we work with, the Nabals that perhaps are even friends, those that deny God because they don't want there to be a God. Help us, Lord, to have the right words to share with them that will change their minds. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace, your forgiveness. We are so thankful for you, Lord. Bless us as we leave now and this week, Lord, we ask for opportunities to share our faith, and when you provide them, give us the words. We won't fret about that, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this body of believers. We pray these things this morning in Jesus' name.